So what do these people need to get started? Why aren't they starting? We all know the answer is fear. But the difference with you guys or me or anybody who's followed through is we're more afraid of the, what life would be like if we don't follow through than the person who's willing to settle for what they got and kind of hope it'll change and maybe purchase something for the moment and then not follow through on it. It's almost like people, overachievers, have a little more fear. They're a little more afraid of missing out. They're afraid of not being there or they got a strong enough reason to follow through. So I'd say if you're looking at home, you want to give somebody some value, go, where do I start? I'm sick of this. That's a damn good place. That's probably why they bought the product in the first place, but now they're not... To escape from that for just a minute. What's that? They bought, it, they bought the product to escape from that state. Just, just for a moment. moment. Yeah. So cause, cause, well, guess what? What makes people excited is progress. You don't have to be at the goal yet to feel alive again. You have to make progress. And the first step to progress is making a decision and buying the product. But then they don't do the second step, which is open the damn thing up. I think another powerful distinction that you're hitting on here is the fact that a lot of people that have breakthroughs in their lives, like including Frank and I both in different, you know, um, success stories, situations, whatever you want to call them, is that, you know, people typically hit rock bottom yeah. before that must is a reality. You're right, you're right. So in thinking of that, you know, because a lot of things as well, like we hear in marketing, you know, like if you had a gun to your head right now and you had to make money in the next, you know, 40 hours, what would you do? And that really resonates with people. But so I just wanted to bring this into the conversation because I think a big part of the market of all these people aren't people that have their backs completely against the wall yet. That's, that's right. Okay, so they're not in a must situation yet. They're in a desire situation where right. they're okay in their lives. They do have big dreams and ambitions. They do want greater things, but it's not pushing them yet to the point where they will do what it takes to master to have the something. Must. So, so what do you think? How, how do people go from not having their backs against the wall when they have no choice to say, I'm totally sick of this, right. to, to conditioning their minds to go from their situation where they are, which may be okay, yeah. to getting something greater. Well, think about this. What pisses you off and what excites you is all relative. You know, $300 a week, no, $2,500 excites him more, that memory to this day, than even the million bucks, you know, he did in you know, his first 24-hour version, right? Or you breaking the form in a mile, a million bucks. That must have been out of your mind. Tell me about that for a second. What did that feel like? You make a million bucks in 24 hours, nobody in history of the internet's done it. Euphoria. Yeah. It was just it's unbelievable. What was your it wasn't even about the money. It that's exactly weird. right. That's exactly right. It wasn't right. really about the money. No, it wasn't. I wasn't thinking like, oh, that's how many cars I can buy. No. Or, I, it just wasn't. It was just, uh, it was just breaking through like another like barrier of, of, of progress. So at that point, it wasn't about your back to your wall. At that point, what it was really about... It was about, a further point for my fear, is what it really was. Further point for your fear, and for some people, and I think in some cases, it's also a recognition of who I am and what I'm capable of. So for somebody whose life is already great, this is about, what if I could take on another skill that could create more freedom for my life? And just saying, I'm not having to go out and try and do it all perfectly right now. What I'm going to do for the next eight weeks, I'm going to do one, I'm going to create a little ritual. I'm going to do one thing a day to condition my mind, Right, so that I get strong, so I follow through. I'm gonna read something, I'm gonna listen to something, I'm gonna immerse myself, I'm gonna go for an intense jog, or I'm gonna go lift weights, but I'm gonna do it consciously to get in a state where I'm gonna follow through. That's number one, because people follow through when they're in state. Second, I'm gonna get clear about why this is a must for me. It's not because my back's against the wall, but because I wanna master any life that could create some freedom. I'm not gonna master it overnight, but I got the system, I got the plan. I'm gonna do one thing a day, I'm gonna work on one subject a week. This week's gonna be about figuring out what the right product or industry is. Next week's gonna be basics of building traffic. And each week I'm gonna make a little progress and I'm gonna to get to a goal, whatever that is. I'm gonna make a thousand bucks, my 300 bucks in a week. I'm gonna to get to my 2,500. That first 2,500 is the most excited. Unbelievable. The first $300. I remember it's the most life-changing too. It is the most life-changing. I remember I was supposed to be a truck driver making 24000 a year because I'd be making the most anybody in my family had ever made. How'd that work out for you? Yeah, very, real well. Thank God I'm not driving a truck, right? I think you could so pull I, the truck. Personally. I figured I could, out, just I like could pull it with my finger, man. I could do it with my teeth. I could pull yeah. it with my teeth, right? Thirty-six grand a year was the goal. If I could make three grand in a month. And when I did that, was out of my mind. And then it was like, could I make ten grand a month? Then it was ten grand in a day, then a hundred grand a day. Then could I make a million dollars in a day? I had a day where I made four hundred million dollars in a day. The stock value of the company I took public, my personal stock. But it was the probably floor. after I did it, though, so it doesn't really count. I'm just joking. <laughs> You're right. People don't remember who was first, Tony. <laughs> 400 totally million, a million? Yeah, who cares? Who cares? No, I'm, just, I'm that's, not saying that's it's That's amazing, though. I'm not saying no, 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 it's because they told me when I was on stage, I had this audience of about 15,000 people at the Continental Center. It was during a stretch break. I was doing what I loved, rocking the house. Everybody's going crazy. And they go, the stock's worth 400 million bucks right now. I was like, wow, that's cool. It's like, 
okay, that's, I don't want to sound stupid, it's like, what's next? And I went right back to what I loved. Once you break through, then it just becomes a game. The people that are getting your products have not yet broken through in most cases. The breakthrough happens by conditioning your mind every day, by feeding it a role model or story. It's putting yourself in a peak state where you fall through by getting physically strong. It's creating a little ritual of doing a little bit each day, and then you get momentum. But the most important thing of all is what we started out with. Why? Absolutely. Why is it a must for you? It doesn't have to be you're up against a wall, but it has to be something you're hungry for, because the only difference in people is hunger. And if you're not hungry, get around people that are hungry and something will hit you. You watch a conversation, you get around people that are doing better, and all of a sudden you start going, uh, my life sucks. I remember I went to a guy in, in LA, he's one of the most multi-billionaire guy, I'll never forget, and I lived in the Del Mar Castle, and I was really proud. That was like the symbol of me having taken myself from being poor to providing for my family this great place. It's built from castles in Europe overlooking the ocean, not far from you. And I went to this guy's house, he's a billionaire, he took me down to his wine cellar, and I don't even drink wine. Went through this whole thing. At the end of the night, I was depressed. I lived in the Del Mar tenement, as far as I was concerned. I really was. I was like, I live in a crappy place, and, and all my standards changed. All of a sudden, I wasn't willing to settle for living that. All of a sudden, my back was to the wall in a different way, because as a man, I knew I was capable of more. So people can change their standard by getting around where it's better. People can change their standard by getting associated with what's true, like the bills they got to solve, the problems they got to do it. Or they can do it because they're excited because it's something new they want to take on. Everyone's different, but they got to find the why and they got to come up with some daily rituals to get them going and just do a step at a time. That's where you get momentum. Awesome. That is awesome. So, you know, think about it. what's the holy grail between somebody taking action or not? It's one word, certainty. When somebody is absolutely certain, they, you know, the common word is believe, right? But you, know, you can believe at a general level or you can believe with certain. When you're absolutely certain that if I do this, it's gonna get that result and that result's gonna change my life, you'll do it. When you think it absolutely is not gonna work, you're never gonna do it. The middle no man's land of maybe it'll work, maybe it won't, that's the piece that kills people, right? So if it's a must for you, you gotta make it work, right? In our case, right, that's an example. If it's not a must for you and you're not sure, you don't know what to do. So I, years ago, I'd look around and say, okay, how do people get themselves to follow through that haven't been following through? What's the difference? And I started interviewing hundreds of people, literally, and eventually thousands, because I had thousands of my events. So I'd ask the group to give me their feedback. And I came up with this model. It's like the holy grail of belief, or the holy grail of momentum. It's like the difference between what makes the rich get richer and the poor get poor, right? And the difference we all know is mindset, but like, how is that built? So this is what I did. I created a stupid little four little boxes, and I'll scribble it here for you. You think about the first thing that determines whether you can do something or not, and I put that in this first box at the top here on the left side, and it's potential. Like, what's the potential of a human being? Like, when you guys started, you proved something no one had done in history. You ran the four-minute mile, right? For golly knows how many centuries, they're trying to run a four-minute mile. Roger Bannister does it. Remember? How did he do it? You did it in this industry, right? You made a million bucks in a day. No one had ever done that in history, right? After you did it, a bunch of other guys are doing it because it became possible. Roger Bannister didn't just go physically practice. He made a shift in his head. He practiced in his head because he could never achieve it physically, so he had a change in his head first so that the result became certain enough he believed it, and then his body got him through. After Roger Bannister ran that four-minute mile, within two years, 37 people ran a four-minute mile. Well, when no one in history had ever done it. Now, here's how it works. The potential for anybody getting your product is extraordinary. They can do what you've done as much, more, or less. They can do whatever they want to do. The potential's there. The market's proven that. Whether or not they tap into that potential has a lot to do with what action they take, which is the question you came to me with, right? Like, you know, God, they all have potential, but they're not taking action. And we all know that the action they take is going to determine the results they get. That's pretty obvious. So, most people have a belief about what their real potential is no matter what you tell them. And that affects how much action they take. And of course that affects the result, and then ironically, that result reinforces their belief. And then that belief affects it. So I'll give you an example. Let's say a person has unlimited potential, we all agree. But they take little action, little results, why? Because they have to start with a problem with their belief. They don't believe it's really going to happen for me. Maybe for Frank Kearns because he's got the cool hair and stuff. Or maybe it's for you because you're so driven, but it's not me. Maybe Tony Robbins because he's a freak, got these big teeth. Whatever their thought process <laughs> is, right? They got this thing, right? But what happens is if you believe that there's very little potential, how much action are you going to take? Nothing. Nothing, little. And when you take little potential with a little action, what kind of results do you get? 
lousy little results. And when you get little results, what does that do to your belief? You go, see, I told you this was a waste of time, sold you this wouldn't work. And then what happens, you tap even less potential, you take even less action, you get even worse results and your belief gets even weaker. And this sucker feeds on itself until you are in the downward spiral. It's poisonous. It's poisonous and it's self-fulfilling. Now, what if something could happen that could come along and fill you with a sense of absolute certainty? Not like I believe, but I mean where you know. In you guys' case, mine as well, we knew because we had to. Because we burned the boats, there was no other option. We had to find a way. We'd had, we weren't going to live that way. We all did it in different ways and for different reasons, but in essence, that was it. If you get yourself in a state of certainty that this is going to work, I'm going to find the way, and if this doesn't work, I will make the way, then you tap a lot more potential. And when you're certain in your potential, you take massive action. When you take massive action, you really believe in something, you get great results. When you get great results, your brain goes, see, I told you I was a stud. <laughs> I told you this thing would work out. Now you're even stronger. You tap more potential, take greater action, greater results. That's how you went from 300 bucks in a week to 2,500 in five days to 100,000 in a month to a million bucks in a day. Same thing with you. And we get momentum. That's why the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. Now, some people go out and they go, well, I'm going to take a bunch of action. All right, I'm going to open this product. I'm going to try it. And they'll say to you, I even did it. But it's like a salesman who goes and knocks on the door and he knocks on 100 doors and says, you don't want one of these, do you? Yeah, exactly right. Yeah. <laughs> and even if he doesn't say it verbally, his face says it because he doesn't believe it's going to work. So his voice, his body, the execution is so weak. Maybe if he talks to 100 people, somebody's going to buy out of pity. Yeah. <laughs> they don't want his kids to starve, right? But he's not going to get the result. So the core difference in people is how do you produce certainty when the world isn't giving it to you? You go out and you try and you try in your case, you're 100,000 in debt, nothing's working. How do you keep yourself going? The way you did it, the way I did it, the way you're doing it, we may not have done it consciously, is we didn't change our potential, that was there, and it wasn't even taking more action. Taking more action with a belief it's not gonna work, it's not gonna change anything. We got results in our head that made us feel certain as if it had already happened. True or false for you? True. Right, so give me an example so people know I'm not just making this crap up. Well, I mean, just like when I had nothing, I already knew I was driving like Ferraris and Porsches and stuff because I always wanted those cars. I al right. already knew I was going to have them. It was inevitable. Right. I inevitably, you know, that was just my inevitable outcome. But how did you do that? Did you have a ritual? Did you think about it regularly? Was it one time you thought about it or was it something you had an obsession towards? I had an obsession towards it. I mean, yeah. I used to go, I used to work at a video store, which was the last job I ever had in my life. Thank God. And uh, I used to go to, to work almost every day and I used to bring two magazines with me to read on my breaks. Entrepreneur magazine just to read about business and everything yeah. else and read about what other people are doing look for role models And I used to carry an auto trader with me and wow. I used to look at Porsches that were for sale Yeah, and people always used to ask me. What are you doing with that auto trader magazine? I'm like, well, I'm just picking out the Porsche that I'm gonna buy right when I'm which probably got you a lot of crap <laughs> I, I, I did I, people made fun of me. I, sure. I actually had a boss at that job tell me you know you really shouldn't do that to yourself John because it's, it's very, very likely that that is never going to happen. That it's very likely that you, you're never going to have that car. Yeah. That's, that's the kind of belief he was trying to put in my head. And I was like, no, you don't realize that it's, it's inevitable right. that I will drive here at sometime in the near future with that car when I'm not working for you right. and drop movies off for you to put back on the shelf. And is that it? actually happened. And it was one of the most oh, fulfilling days of my entire life. And the great thing was when I pulled up in this car, I was, well, you know, I was in my mid twenties. Yeah. A car that most mid twenty. What know, kind of car was it? It was a Porsche 911 Turbo. It was sure. a convertible and everything. Sure. It was a beautiful car. It was one I, one out. Yeah. One I always dreamed to have. And, but you know, for a few years, it I always circled the ads of which ones I was going to buy. Well, when I finally got it and I pulled up at the store, you know, I had all these people. Some people that were still working at this seven dollar an hour job were there years after I left. And I'll never forget this, even the boss and stuff, and, and the reaction of the people was like, wow, that is awesome. Yeah. Is that your dad's car? <laughs> and all I said to them was, not exactly. Good for and you. I just smiled and just left. But it was, you know, I just, I, I, it's the weirdest thing, but I just knew it was going to happen. But you knew it because I you I conditioned did, myself you to You did it over and over again. Was, yeah. When I was in high school, I was not a popular kid, but I was passionate and intense, and I'll never forget. Some people, had given, some particular girls gave me some crap, and a guy too. And I wrote in their journals or their, you know, their annual yearbook at the end, I wrote, you know, someday, I said, you treated me like hell. Someday, I'll be rich and famous, and you'll be an effing truck driver. 
and you'll be sitting there, I'll be with my rich, I'll be, be with this beautiful woman in my life, rich, and you'll be watching me on television thinking, you wish you would have treated me better. I actually wrote this shit in people's <laughs> annuals because I went to a 10 year high school reunion and <laughs> people went and showed me <laughs> this stuff, great. right? But it's like, I burned the bridges, baby. I was like, there, this is how it's gonna be. So I'll give you a perfect example of this. You know, they did studies, many have been done at this element, where they wanna say, how much does the mind affect performance? So take basketball. I've worked with a lot of NBA players and turned them around. And one of the problems many of them have is they'll choke on the free throw line. You know, well, everybody knows in that case, if you normally shoot really well and now you're not, something's interfering. Something's getting in front of your state, some uncertainty, right? Obviously. So they take a group and say, we're going to make them better. How do you make somebody better who's got this mental block? So they take a group of guys and they're going to do free throws and they do one group where they just practice for six weeks. Totally intense practice, and I forget the number of free throws, but they got to do this many free throws every day. Take a second group, and they have them not practice at all. Obvious. And they take a third group, and they don't let them touch a basketball. All they do is have them practice in their mind, but the key is, it's not practice makes perfect, it's perfect practice makes perfect, as corny as that sounds. So these guys see themselves making the shot every single time conditioning their mind and body that it's perfect every time. They're not interrupted by a reality that would screw with them. So at the end of six weeks, they tally it up, and now they give them a test to see who has the highest free throw percentage you know, success. And what do you guess it's going to be? Well, the obvious person says, obviously, it's not the guys that didn't practice, but which one is it, the mind or is it the ones that actually practice? I'm assuming the mind. Yeah, you would assume it because it's true. Right. You intuitively know the truth that practicing's not enough. It's getting yourself so certain so many times that now when you go to do it, there's no hesitancy and you execute. It's having that absolute certainty that makes you tap your full potential, take massive action, get massive results, be reinforced to having stronger belief. This is what makes somebody a star at anything. Welcome back to Your Breakthrough. We're going to talk in this session about the exact formula for what creates long-term happiness, what creates unhappiness, what creates suffering, and what the antidotes are, of which there's only three. How do I know this? I've had the privilege of being with four million people now from 100 countries around the world in live seminars, and I've seen everything you can imagine. I mean from the most successful people in the world to the singularly most challenged people you could possibly imagine. I dealt with people with multiple personality disorders, 52 different personalities and how to put them back together. And I dealt with people with no personality who have a much bigger problem. No matter what the diversity of people I've dealt with and the diversity you've seen in this show, the ultimate question I'm always asking is, how do I help people to break through? The question is, what are you breaking through to? In essence, all of us at some level to feel alive have to always feel like we're growing. When people ask me, what does it take to be happy, I always tell them one word, progress. Progress equals happiness. Even if you're not where you want to be yet, if you're on the road, if you're improving, if you're making progress, you're going to love it. You're going to feel alive. On the other hand, it doesn't matter how successful you are, if you stop growing, you start dying inside. Now, how does this relate to this session on Breakthrough? Well, I'll say it's really simple. If you and I want to know what it takes to be happy, we have to understand what is our current blueprint of how our life's supposed to be. Now, what do we mean by blueprint? Well, we have a story in our head of how life's supposed to be. Some people's story is you work hard in school, you become really great, you're a nice person, you're a good person, and then you grow up and you take care of yourself and you find the ideal man and you fall in love and you have a white picket fence and you have three perfect children and you live happily ever after. Somebody else's story, the old story was, you work really hard in school, you excel in college, you go to work for a big corporation, and you move up through the ranks until you're the president or chairman of the company, and you become successful and respected throughout life. These are some old stories. Obviously, the stories that we hear today of what people's lives are supposed to be like are completely diverse. We no longer have these little archetypes. But one archetype still seems to remain. And that archetype is, in order for you to really feel like you're enough, many people believe they have to achieve an enormous amount. They may, may do it in different ways. Today. They may do it by building a company and taking it public when they're 27 or 25 years old, or you know, they find and create a new technology, or they become a very special doctor. But we live in a culture in the West that teaches people that you're not enough unless you do something really special and unique. And we define special and unique in interesting ways. A school teacher is not special and unique. A mother 
who stays home with her children day and night, sculpting their minds, their bodies, their souls, and their future is not special. We live in a world today where we treat teachers like they're nobody and pay them accordingly, and we wonder why our children seem to have challenges in learning and growing or being engaged in school. We spend thousands of dollars on some item like a computer, but what we look at overall, we invest in for the teacher and for that person who's the personal connection with them is so small. We live in a society where many women look down and say, well, you're just a housewife, you're just a mother. See, some of the pain we have in our society is not because there's one right or one wrong approach, but because we try to make everybody fit into some particular approach to life. Here's what's going to make you happy or make you unhappy in life. It's real simple. Let's do a quick test. If you're in a situation right now where you look at your life, I know there's an area of your life that you probably feel pretty darn good about. Even if you're not happy with your finances, I bet you feel damn good close to your kids. Or if you're not close to your kids, uh, maybe you don't have any kids, maybe you feel really good about your career. If you're doing not so good in your career, maybe you've got a really great body that you've trimmed down or strengthened up or you, know, you really shaped yourself the way you want muscularly or in the way you look. Or if that's not happening, maybe you feel a really special connection with God or really close to your mother or father or your family, whatever. Almost everybody has an area of their life they feel really good about it if they're honest and if they're fair to themselves. What's an area of your life you really feel happy about? I want you to think about it for a moment, truthfully. What's an area in your life today that if you wanted to be happy about it, you really could feel proud about it? You could feel like it's an area you're doing darn well in. And if you're really hard on yourself, there's still an area. What's an area? I want you to think of it right now. And I want you to think of that area, whether it's your body or your finances or your career or your intimate relationship or your relationship with your kids or your relationship with your creator. Whatever it is, I want you to think about why are you happy with that area of your life right now today? Why are you happy with that area of your life right now today? Really think about it. If you were in a seminar with me, I'd have you write this down. And if you can, you can put me on hold here for a second, because I'd like to reveal to you what the formula is for happiness. And if I say there's a formula for happiness and here's what it is, you're going to go, yeah, yeah, sure, that's what he says. But if you put down the answer and we can see the formula is real without me telling you what it is, you get to look at your own life and say it matches. You're going to know this is right. So you could stop this right now if you want, put me on hold, and just write down what's an area of your life you're really, really happy about, you're really pleased with, or you could be if you wanted to focus on it, and why are you happy with that part of your life right now? Even if you're not happy with everything, what's the area you're happy with and why? Put me on hold right now, or if you're not going to do that, just think for a moment. Why? Specifically, be real. Why? Now, when I ask this, if you turn me back on now, if I ask this of an audience, I'll have people write this down for a few minutes, and I'll call on people, and I'll say, share with the person next to you first, what are you happy about, and why are you happy in that area, and be specific. And after they share, I'll have people stand up, I'll call on a variety of people, and I say, ma'am, tell me, what are you happy about? And she'll say, well, honestly, I'm really happy with my body. She goes, I never thought I'd say that, but I used to be so unhappy with it, and you know, I finally, I, I did some things, I pushed myself through, and now I exercise regularly. And, you know, I'm not perfect, but I feel fit, I feel strong, I feel energetic. And that's really, I don't know, it just feels good to me. Now, I say to everybody, I'm now going to show you what the formula for happiness is. And it's real simple, I want to reveal it to you so you don't ever forget it. Whenever you're happy with an area of your life, it's because right now, your current life experience, I call it your LC, your life conditions, conditions of your life, your life conditions in that area match or equal to your blueprint, your story, your belief about how life should be in that area. So this woman says to me, I'm really happy with my body because it's not perfect. Her blueprint is I don't need to be perfect, but it's so much better than it was. I'm fit and I'm strong and I have this energy. Her mental blueprint says I should be fit, strong and have energy. I don't need to be perfect, but I should be that way. Well, when my life, my body matches how I think it should be, I feel good about my life. I'll ask somebody else. I'll say, you know, tell me an area you're happy with. Someone else will say, well, I'm really happy with my career. And why? Well, I'm doing better than I even thought I would be. I mean, I, I'm ahead of the schedule of where I hoped I'd be at this stage. I'm working at this level in this company, and I have these skills and this ability, and it's even better than I thought. Well, once again, listen, this person's happy with this area of their life because their current life conditions in the area called their career are even better than they expected they would be, better than their blueprint, better than their belief of how, how it should be. If it's really better, you tend to be over the moon. 
well, one woman would say, you know, I, I gotta tell you, I said, I'm the happiest I've ever been in my whole life. How come? She goes, because I have this man in my life and I'm in love with him and he loves me and I can be myself with him. And he, we have this incredible intimacy and this passion and we want to be with each other all the time and, and I never get bored with him. Well, what's her blueprint? You want to be with somebody that you can have total intimacy with, somebody who you love and loves you. Those are part of her rules, her beliefs of how it should be. She said, you know, it needs to be, I never want to be with anybody else. I want to be with them every moment. Her blueprint about how life should be and the way she lives, her relationships even better than she hoped. When it's better than you hope, you're going to be totally excited. So think about this then. What's an area you're not happy with? Let's see if we can find the formula for unhappiness. If the formula for happiness is to be able to meet your expectations or exceed them, that really makes you excited. But to be happy, you got to at least meet it. It doesn't have to be perfect. But if you generally are meeting what you expect you want from your life in that area, you feel good. Life conditions match blueprint, feel good. So what makes you feel bad? What creates pain, stress, frustration? Real easy way to figure it out. Answer this question. What's an area of your life you're not happy with? I mean, be honest with yourself. And even if your life is great in all kinds of ways, I'm sure there's an area you'd like to improve. Anybody who's honest, if they're doing great in their career, very often they don't take care of their body so much. If they're really focused on their body, you know, very often they find themselves in a position where they're not spending enough time with their kids. Or if they're spending time with their kids, their intimate relationship's not doing so well. Because it's the nature of human beings to focus on areas they feel comfortable with and strong in and give those time in the areas they don't feel so strong and they go, I don't have time for it. What they're really saying is, I don't feel very competent in that area. So what's an area of your life that you are not as happy with? I mean, it's healthy, honestly, to look at areas and say, I don't like it. I want more. This whole concept of a breakthrough is about how do I close the gap between where I am right now and where I want to be. That's what we're here to do. It's like, here's where I want to be. Here's where I am. It's healthy to see there's a gap. That makes me have this hunger, this drive to grow, to feel alive, to expand as a human being. So what's an area you're not pleased with? Is it your body? Is it your finances? Is it your career? Is it your spiritual life or lack thereof in terms of feeling connected in that area? Is it your kids? Right? What's the area? What's the area that's not where you want it to be? And then answer for a moment, why aren't you happy with that area of your life right now? Why specifically today are you not happy with that area of your life at this stage of your time of your life? Again, you can stop this and write it down. It might be useful for you. Or if you're going to keep it running, you can stop it and you'll turn it right back on and I'll kick into it. Do that now. Or if you kept it running, then just I'll give you what happens. I have people write this down and they don't like this exercise so much. Well, I don't like my body or I don't like my finances. I don't like my career. I don't like the person I'm in a relationship with. I don't like myself the way I'm in relationships. Why? And they write it all down. Have people share back and forth. I call on people and the lesson's pretty clear. I tell people in advance, here's the formula for unhappiness. I'll show you before you do anything else. When your life conditions, when your life conditions, the way you're living your life today, does not match, it doesn't equal your blueprint, your story of how it's supposed to be, then you're going to have disappointment, frustration, or pain. If your life is way different than the way you think it's supposed to be, you can have enormous pain. If it's a little different, you might feel stressed. Make sense? So people stand up and I say, tell me, you know, what's the area you're not happy with? And the person says, well, you know, I'm really not happy with my finances. And I go, why? And they say, because I'm doing worse now than I was five years ago. I made mistakes in the market and at this stage of my life, I should have this much money and I don't have it. And I don't know how to change it. And it's making me crazy. And why are they crazy? You say, well, because they don't have their economic needs met. No, you cannot have your economic needs met and you can still be okay. But when you have an idea, this is what my need is, and I did the wrong thing. My life doesn't match how I'm supposed to be. That's when people get a little crazy. See, think about it. If you grew up taking care of folding your own clothes, making your own meals, going to the store, doing the grocery shopping, cleaning the bedroom, cleaning the house, vacuuming, taking out the trash, and you did that your whole life, then if you have to do that later on, you don't feel like you have economic pain because you don't have a maid. But if you grew up in an environment where everything was done for you, you never have to work, and now suddenly you have to work incredibly hard to just pay enough money to pay your bills, and all of a sudden food is building up, and the house is dirty, and 
your clothes aren't folded and nothing matches, you might find yourself really angry and frustrated because you have a different story about how life's supposed to be than how it is. Someone else will say, well, I'll tell you why, because I'm in a situation now where, you know, I'm 30 pounds heavier than I should be. Should be is the key word. There are people, there are people in all cultures who love being big. There are people that will walk around and someone else might think they're massively overweight, but they'll go, I own this, honey, and they really, truly, they match their blueprint. Big is beautiful, because their idea is big is beautiful, I'm big, that's beautiful, matches my blueprint, rock and roll, I'm happy as can be. Somebody else can look like a twig and be stressed out saying, I hate my body, because their blueprint says I should be the skinniest thing on earth and I'm not skinny enough. Am I making sense? When your life conditions don't match your blueprint, you're going to have pain. But here's when you suffer. When I ask people, who here has been through the dark night of the soul? Who's been here in a situation where you feel like, like, like life, life isn't worth living? Or we feel like a pain that just will never go away? And a lot of people write down those experiences, like Joaquin. So you'll begin to understand what the issue is I'm talking about here. Joaquin, if you recall, was in a situation where this man felt like there was no reason to live. He couldn't work. He couldn't do anything. His life was worthless. Why did he think that? Because he had a blueprint. And his blueprint said, I need to be an NBA basketball player, or at least a professional basketball player. I need to be able to make money and have this great lifestyle because that's what makes me worthwhile as a human being. That's what makes my family respect me, my mother, my, my uncles, my aunts. I'm the successful one in the family, and I make the money. I support everybody. He's a good man. He didn't come just to be successful. He took care of his mother, his family. He's, he tried to be an inspiration for people. Joaquin Hawkins is a man who was always going out on his free time and training kids and showing them the pathway to freedom, how they could play basketball and get free like he did and get out of the inner city. So this man is not a selfish man, but he knew this is the way to be worthwhile. This is the way to be able to give to people. This is the way to take care of your family. And all of a sudden, one night, what happened? That way was taken from him. He has a stroke. And in the middle of the night, his life conditions make it impossible to be who he has to be or he feels like he's worthless. You get it? We have a, an identity. We have a, a, a story of how we're supposed to be. And if life somehow gets in the way of that story, we feel pain. But if we feel we have no control, that's when we go into suffering. See, it's one thing to say my life doesn't match my blueprint. I got to lose weight. That might stress you out. Or my life doesn't match my blueprint. I I'm not in a relationship. I got to get in one. That might motivate you even. You might not like it, but you're going to find a way to get in one. Or my career doesn't match how I should be. You could change it. But when you start believing that your life doesn't match your blueprint and you have no control to change it, you're helpless, that's when people suffer. And so this week for your breakthrough, it's a chance for you to start to take a look at your blueprint anywhere you're really having pain. Hey, look, if you're doing great in some area of your life, celebrate it, of course, and I'm sure there are many areas you are. But life is really a series of growth spurts. I mean, two things in life make you feel alive, growing and giving. And what's really wonderful about this man, Joaquin, is he was constantly growing, trying to get better, trying to be a better teammate, a better basketball player. Think about it. When he didn't make the teams and he didn't make the NBA, he didn't give up. He worked even harder. The guy was always striving, striving to become something. And he became it. And he achieved it. And then life took it from him. Isn't that the common denominator with so many of the people in the stories of this six-part series that you saw, these six specials? I mean, Frank and Kristen had a blueprint of what life was supposed to be about. We're supposed to get married and have children and we're going to have our own business. And all of a sudden, life doesn't match the blueprint. And suddenly, there's depression. Because in their case, they said there's nothing we could do. But they were wrong. They were wrong because they discovered, and Frank discovered, I can make a difference in my wife. The chair, even though I didn't create this and didn't ask for it, this chair does not define me. I can become more than I was before. I can have the impact with my wife. I can have children. We had to change his blueprint because we couldn't change all the conditions of his life. Does that make sense? I couldn't get him to physically walk again. Maybe someday he will, but we can't count on that. What we gotta count on is that he can be fulfilled by seeing he isn't helpless. 
And I did that through a series of experiences that violated what he thought he couldn't do. The same thing was true with almost every one of the people we worked with at some level. And in Joaquin's example, it was also true. Joaquin said, well, I, I can't ever have this quality of life again because I'm not a professional basketball player. And he was locked into that mindset, and all of us get locked at times. But to his credit, to a system of steps, we were able to break him out of that. We were to get him to see that he isn't helpless. Because here's your choice. Watch this now. If you're suffering, if you're in pain, your life doesn't match how you think it should be. And you think you're helpless to change it. Now you have only three choices. Choice one, blame something. And that's what Joaquin did, if you recall. He blamed his coach. He blamed what happened to him. And of course, these things were outside his control. But he blamed his coach. And a big part his of the coaching, healing, getting him to see, hey, you know what, all that anger, all that resentment inside of you, Joaquin, A, it's not based on the truth. And B, like Nelson Mandela said, you know, having resentment in your soul is like drinking poison and hoping that your enemy will die. It doesn't work that way. And when Joaquin was able to break out, his breakthrough was a change in perception to realize this coach wasn't stopping me. I just felt like I lost everything and so I don't know how to change it. So I'm looking for something to be mad about, someone to blame. So, so I don't have to blame myself or I don't have to feel so helpless. Because when you're angry, you don't feel so helpless. You feel strong for the moment, even though it's a fake strength. When he was able to make that breakthrough, he could stop blaming. Because these are your three choices. When life doesn't match how you think it should be, blame something, an event, someone else, or yourself. As we talked about earlier in this series, blame games just destroy you. There's no progress when you blame. For the moment, you feel okay, but nothing changes. What are your real choices? You only have two choices in life. If life doesn't match your blueprint, you either have to change your life. That is, you gotta say, you know what? My body isn't there, I'm gonna go work out. My relationship isn't there, I'm gonna change it. You know, I'm not making what I gotta make, I'm gonna retool, I'm gonna get a new skill, I'm gonna go back to school, I'm gonna start a business, I'm gonna do something. You have to do something to change your life. Or, in order for you to be happy, if you can't change your life, you're gonna have to change your blueprint. Usually in life it requires a little bit of each. Does that make sense? And if you change your, take, change your life and change your blueprint, you can have an extraordinary life. And what you witnessed this man do was once he let go of his anger and his denial, once he started to look at things, he began to find by spending time with his family that he was worthwhile being loved whether he played basketball or not. Of course he'd love to play basketball, but professional basketball was no longer a part of it. And we had to get Joaquin to shift that. And Joaquin is a metaphor for all of us. Because all of us are gonna have times in our life when what we want or think life should be like isn't gonna match how life really is. Those moments, if we blame, our life goes into pain. If we change, we can change our life and match our blueprint. But we have to also know when it's not within our control. And that's how we're able to make a shift and change what our story is for our life, what our expectations are. Not by lowering them, but by changing what that model really is. I hope this makes sense to you. I'll give you a great example. Years ago, I, uh, I do a lot of work with business people, celebrities, people of all kinds of walks of life. And I was dealing with a group of people and they knew a very, very powerful celebrity and without to give that person privacy, I won't tell you too many details, you can't figure out exactly who it is, but it would be a person who was very successful as a woman uh, who was extremely attractive by cultural standards, uh, a woman who uh, had a lot of dear friends, a lot of deep respect, um, so great skill, great ability, extremely talented, quite attractive, quite wealthy in financial terms, and lots of great friends. This would be for most people's idea, the ultimate blueprint. If your life matches that description, you must have an incredible life. But ironically, this particular individual, as famous as they were, was depressed all the time. They had seemingly everything, and yet the person was depressed. How do you get depressed when you're smart, and you're strong, and you're beautiful, and you've got great friends, and you're rich, and you're famous? Well, it's real simple. People said, I don't know what it is. Everyone's tried to help her. She's been on the, through counseling. She's got all these different drugs. Nothing's working. She's taking antidepressants and she's still depressed, which is not uncommon, by the way. Because if you change the way you feel physically, but you still see your life doesn't match how you think it should be at some level, and you feel like you're helpless to change it, you're going to be depressed. So I said, bring her to me. I said, I can help her. I know that sounds like hyperbole, but I absolutely can help her. Well, how do you know that, Tony? Because I already know what the problem is. 
I know if someone's depressed, it's because they feel helpless because their life doesn't match how they think it should be. I just don't know what her blueprint is, but we'll find out what it is, and we'll either help her change her life or we'll help her change her blueprint or both. Long story short and very quickly, I'll tell you the core of it. She came to me and she spent maybe the first half an hour telling me, apologizing, saying, I know I should be happier. I know it's silly for me to be depressed. I don't know why I'm so depressed. I, I, I know I should be grateful for what I have, and I am grateful. And it was all these reasons why she knows she should feel good but still didn't. And I tried to finally explain to her, listen, I don't care about that. I care about you. The fact that you're not happy has nothing to do with what you have or don't have. The fact that you're not happy is that your life doesn't match the way you think it should be. And you have some idea of how you think it should be. And worse, if you're this depressed after all this time, you feel like you can't do anything. You have no power to change it. You feel helpless. And she looked at me in a certain way, and I said, so what is that? What did you want your life to be like? She goes, well, it sounds stupid. I said, it's not going to sound stupid to me. She said, well, I don't know. I just always, since I was a little girl, dreamed that I would be married, and I would have three basically perfect children, and they would love me totally, and I loved my husband. He'd love me. And, and I said, okay, so how's that working for you so far? And she said, well, I think you know, because she's a pretty famous person. She said, I'm divorced twice. I have no children. And, you know, I'm now X age. And to give you a clue, that age would be an age where having a child, your own natural child at least, barring a medical miracle, is not going to happen. So I said to her, well, why don't you just adopt? She goes, no, 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 that's not it. And so what I had to dig under is, remember we talked in one of the earlier sessions about there's the surface problem and then there's the deeper desire or need. So I said to her, I said, well, what if you couldn't have the husband but you could have the kids? And she smiled and she said, I'd take that. <laughs> I said, well, why not adopt a kid? She goes, no, it has to be my own blood children. So I kept digging to find out what was behind her blueprint. Because your blueprint is just a projection of what you think you need to be happy. But as human beings, we're notoriously ineffective at knowing it's going to make us happy. So much of what we think we're going to make us happy, we get there and we go, is this all there is? So many things that we think are going to make us miserable and we can never deal with, we go through it and we can handle it. We're not good at projecting these things. There are all kinds of studies will show this. So I said to her, well, what, what are you hoping to get from these three children? Why do they have to be your blood children? And she finally said, well, if they're my blood children, I know they'll always love me. They'll never leave me. What was she looking for? Unconditional love. She had this big blueprint that said, white house, picket fence, three children, perfect husband, you know, all these different things. But what was behind that was a need, a need to feel like she could have love that would be certain and wouldn't go away. So I can help her meet that need. So I said to her, I said, well, Maybe one reason you don't have a husband is because every time you look at one, you're trying to figure out if he's going to get you those three kids in time and how that's going to happen. And maybe he feels a little stressed when you're looking at him this way because he can feel what's going on behind your bed even if he doesn't know what the words are. And she started to laugh. She goes, I guess I've probably been that way a good portion of my life. And she goes, people wonder, you know, why I'm so uptight. I said, you're uptight because you were felt like you're running out of time trying to meet some picture. But I said, all you really want is love. I said, don't you have a lot of love in your life? Tell me about your friends. And gradually, I got her to start seeing this love that she was trying to get was already here. It didn't match the picture. Maybe, maybe we could paint a new picture of what life could really be like and make sure that picture met her deepest needs. That's basically what we did with Joaquin. Joaquin wanted to be a professional basketball player because he loved basketball, yes, but also because he wanted to be that man who was a leader. He wanted to be the man who was the good man. He wanted to be the one who brought energy to people. He wanted to be the man people would look up to. He wanted to be the man who could take care of his family in style, all of his family, not just his daughters and his wife, but other people as well. Underneath it all, he wanted to know that he mattered. And through the process that you saw in this show, he began to find out that he didn't need to be angry at the world, that yes, his blueprint was taken from him, but his soul and his ability to be a special human being that could touch other people was not taken from him. That maybe his real gift was his ability to inspire young kids, his ability to get himself to do whatever it took. How did he become a professional basketball player? Unbelievable discipline, unbelievable drive. He started bringing that to picking up trash, and the game started to change. He started to have fun there. He could come home and take care of his kids and pay his bills. 
That doesn't solve everything, but it gives him a way to suddenly regain himself. When he sat around with all of his family, and you saw part of those scenes, and if you watch little areas of browsing this week, you'll see some more scenes from his family where you see him begin to realize they love me whether I'm rich or poor. They love me whether I'm a professional basketball player or not. They love me. That's what he was really after. And when he got that, it allowed him to let go and say, I can do other things. That doesn't mean he won't have challenges. We're all going to have challenges in our life. It doesn't mean that at times he won't wish he's doing more. But he's no longer stuck. He's broken through because he now knows I have control. I can change my life or I can change my blueprint. And when I do, I can fulfill it. I can start to feel that aliveness. Now here's the trap. What do you think happens once you fulfill your blueprint regularly? Once you figure out how to do what you always dreamed of? You always dreamed to live a certain way and now you're living that way, living that way, living that way every day. Well, the human nervous system, the human spirit needs to grow. So pretty soon you'll get bored with that and you'll come up with a new blueprint. <laughs> that's part of the part of life that's exciting. See, if you and I, from this day forward, are going to be happy, just remember what we've said. It takes two things, grow and give. A meaningful life comes from growing, that sense of progress, and it comes from having life not just be about me, but about we, doing something that makes me feel connected to other people besides myself. That growth, that sense of contribution fills a deep spiritual need that we all have. If you are unhappy in your life, you've got three choices, really two, Blame, that's not a choice, it's not going to work. Don't blame someone else, don't blame the event, don't blame yourself. Just figure out what you're going to do to change your life. That's my specialty. If you like my coaching or my team's coaching, come visit with us. Come to an event, come get a coach, come through a program, and we'll guide you through it more than just a few minutes like this, and we'll do it directly, an environment that will shift you. Or change your blueprint. You're going to have to rewire what's going on inside, and that's what we focus on as well. So I hope this journey has been an interesting one for you. I hope it's opened up your eyes to what it takes to go from where you are to where you want to be. It takes changing your emotional pattern. It takes bringing presence to your life. It takes realizing you have no problems compared to somebody else and putting your life in perspective. It takes the ability to deal with those extreme stresses that happen in your life by questioning your limiting beliefs. And again, if we'd love to coach you and show you how to change those in a permanent way where it happens automatically, just like lifting weights so often until the muscle's always there and you find yourself able to follow through. It takes for you to be able to figure out how to deal with crisis and how to turn it around. It takes facing your fear. It takes pushing yourself through what used to stop you. It takes putting yourself in a position where you connect to what's more important than just yourself, what you value than just yourself. And it takes, I think in this case also, the ability to realize that no matter what happens to you, you're more than that moment. You're more than the story you think you're supposed to be. And that even when you're not matching what you think you need to be, maybe there's a reason for that. Maybe you're having to find a different part of yourself that's going to fulfill you at a much deeper level. Sometimes failing to get your goal gives you your destiny. I can't tell you how many people I've known over the years who had an idea of what they thought their life was supposed to be like and they didn't achieve it, and they felt miserable and upset and frustrated, and one day an opening happened, and they went, oh my God, thank God that didn't happen. I think it's Garth Brooks had a great song, and it's a song about when he was in high school, and he was in love with this girl, infatuated with her, and she didn't even know that he existed. And he prayed to God every day that she would notice him, that she would fall in love with him, and then, sure enough, she never did. He was so disappointed. His blueprint didn't match. His life didn't match it because she didn't even know he existed. And he felt this suffering. He could do nothing to turn it around. Well, 15 years later, he became a guy named Garth Brooks, somebody everybody knew. And he could rock you know, stadiums with his energy and his song and his music. And he goes back to be at his high school reunion. I think it was his 15-year reunion, if I remember correctly. I don't remember the exact year. But all I remember is... He said he saw that woman that he was so obsessed by. He was looking forward to seeing her. And now he was Garth Brooks, and he met her. And after he met her and spent some time with her, he wrote a song called Thank God for Unanswered Prayers. <laughs> Sometimes not getting your blueprint is the best thing that ever happened because the disappointment drives you to find something more important inside of you. Or not getting it makes you look for another aspect of your life, a spiritual aspect, a, a family aspect, a physical aspect. If you can just trust that life doesn't happen to you, it happens for you, then you can find in any situation a benefit that can take your life to the next level. I don't care if you're Frank and Kristen 
I don't care if you're, you know, Mandy and Scott. I don't care if you're Joaquin and Kim. Every one of us in our life is going to face situations where it feels like we have total trauma, something that's been taken from us. The real question is, what are you going to do with it? Some people just live in their story of what they don't have, and they have the right to do that. If Frank and Kristen lived in pain and felt bad, we'd all say they have the right to do it. It's the difference between what you have the right to do and what you deserve to give yourself and others. We have the ability to transcend whatever happens to us. There's something called post-traumatic growth. Very few people know about it. Two people go through the same stress. One's destroyed, the other grows. What's the difference? The people that grow will not give up. They don't have any excuses. They find the way to break through whatever it takes. And when they do, three things happen. Number one, they realize who they really are and what they're capable of. They realize they're so much stronger than they thought they were. And number two, they deepen all their relationships. You want to know who really cares about you, who you love and who loves you? Go through some tragedy. Go through some hard times. All your Facebook friends go away. Your real friends, your real family shows up for you, and you show up for them, and it deepens your relationships. And the third thing happens, if you can push yourself through and break through whatever challenges life gives you, is each time you have a breakthrough, you get stronger. And it almost like builds a psychological immunity in you, where suddenly, all of a sudden, it's like stuff happens, you know stuff's going to happen, and you're not scared of it anymore. Because after you've been through a stroke, after you've been through you know, losing the use of some of your body, your senses, after you lose a family member, and you break through to that, you get to the other side, it's like, give me your best shot, life. It's almost like there's this psychological immunity that says, I'm ready for whatever life will give me. I don't want challenges, but if they're here, I know I can handle them. That strength of spirit is what creates a sense of freedom and joy in life. And that strength of spirit basically comes from living a life where you are constantly and never-ending filling your way to improve yourself and to help others. That's my mission. And if we can serve you again in the future, I hope you'll check us out. There's three ways you can continue to participate with us. You can come to an event. Come have an experience with us live at a weekend at our Unleash the Power Within or our Date with Destinies. I think you'll find it's very different than just sitting here talking to you quietly sitting in front of your computer screen. It's a rock and roll environment. It's like going to the ballpark and having one person sitting there talking to you versus being in the ballpark of the rock and roll concert, you know, with 50,000. There's an energy and a power that comes from it. Second is there's immersion. Here we talk for an hour, there's distractions and emails, there it's total focus, and we go for immersion where literally what we did here over six weeks, a few little conversations, all that happens over and over again multiple times a day, and you get that shift. So come to an event or call up and get a coach. We have people that you can work with and have a free coaching session and make sure it's really valuable for you. But these are people that can check in with you to help make sure you break through. You make the changes you want to make in your career or your finances or your body or your emotions or whatever area matters to you. And finally, lastly, and probably most importantly, every day you've got to feed your mind. Because every day most of us are turning on you know, some form of news. It shows up in our pocket and our Blackberries or I, you know, iPods or iPhones, I should say. It shows up on, you know, on your computer constantly. It chases us and it rarely does a good idea interrupt you. Really what you have to do is pursue the ideas, pursue the experiences that are going to change your life. And we have a way to do it called net time, no extra time. A way where you can keep feeding your mind the stuff that really matters with some products or services. So if you're interested in any of those things, be sure to click on your interest of an event or interest in having a free coaching session. Or maybe try one of our audio programs because the other challenge here is with video, you've got to sit here potentially and watch me. But with audio, you can do it while you're working out. You can do it while you're cleaning the house. You can do it while you're driving in the car, while you're getting to work. We'd love to continue serving you in any way we can. I know I've gone long in this session, but I really want you to think about how can I give my life the way I want it to be? The way I do it is I figure out what my blueprint is and I update it for what life is. I change my life, match my blueprint, and suddenly my life feels full and alive. Thank you for the time that we spent together here. I've really enjoyed our time, and I hope that this breakthrough series reminds you to never settle for less than you can be. Never settle for less than you can give or you can share. Live strong, live with passion, and God bless. The United States has had its credit rating downgraded for the first time in its history. We suffer from a fiscal cancer. It is growing within us. Soaring price of gasoline, now three sixty-seven a gallon on average. And by reforming our tax code in a way that asks the wealthiest Americans and biggest corporations to pay their fair share.
Hi, I'm Tony Robbins. Listen, right now there's a debate raging in this country, especially in an election year, and it's a debate about how to solve the economic problems that we're all now facing. We've spent beyond our means for decades as a nation, and now we're getting to a tipping point, one that's so significant, one that's so dangerous, that even the S&P acted to lower our sovereign credit rating for the first time in history. I think we all know that politicians, whether they be congressmen or senators, or even presidents of the United States, whether they be on the right or the left, they tend to promote whatever supports their ideology, whatever they believe in, or unfortunately, whatever will get them elected or maybe reelected. But if you're independent in your thinking, the raw and real facts, the data, the simple facts can be extremely helpful in answering this big current political debate, which is how do we become solvent once again as a nation? Can we get there just by raising taxes on, quote, millionaires and billionaires? Can we truly cover all our expenses by just soaking the rich? Or do we have to, as painful as it might sound, find a way to cut some of our expenses, even the difficult ones? Liberals say tax the rich and that'll do it. Conservatives say that'll destroy the economy and you have to cut expenses. Common sense, I think, says that we have to do both. Wouldn't you agree? Well, regardless of your political point of view, I think this quick video will give you a really cool perspective on the size of our economic challenge by demonstrating Based on this year's expenses, what our current Congress and the President has set up for 2012, what will it take in taxes to cover it all? What would it take if we taxed all the richest corporations, the richest people, will it cover it, or how much more would we need? I think the answer might really blow your mind. So let's talk about these numbers, a million, a billion, and a trillion. I mean, you see these numbers being thrown around every day of our lives, and you know, you hear the numbers like a trillion today. You never hear a million when you talk about the federal government. It's always billions and trillions, and trillions are often discussed over pizza today. So how much is a million versus a billion? Our minds kind of go numb. One way to do it is to convert into something that you can relate to, like seconds. If I asked you how long ago was a million seconds ago, what would your first gut reaction be? Don't try to think in your head, just in your gut. What's inside you? A million seconds, would that be a day ago, a million seconds ago, a week ago, a month ago, a year ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago? What would you guess? The answer is 12 days ago. One million seconds was 12 days ago. Now, on the other hand, what would you say a billion seconds ago was? Well, again, if it's 12 days for a million, what would a billion seconds come up to? How far back would we have to go to get to a billion seconds so we get a sense of proportion? Well, some people might say, well, if it's 12 days for a million, maybe it's a year or 10 years or, or 20 years. No, in fact, it's 32 years to get to a billion seconds ago. It'd be 1980. To give you a perspective, President Carter was the President of the United States at that time. We had movies like The Shining or The Empire Strikes Back. In Iran, they had Americans hostage, if you remember that. Some conflicts, I guess, don't change no matter how long you go back. So that's the difference, 12 days versus 32 years, a million versus a billion. But the number we hear thrown around these days by politicians is a trillion dollars. And the truth is we have $15.4 trillion in deficit in this country. And that doesn't count the unfunded liabilities that come from Medicare and Social Security, which some statistics show that it's up to $117 trillion. So how long would a trillion seconds ago have been? Again, a million is 12 days ago, a billion 32 years ago. What would you think a trillion would be? 500 years? 1,000 years? The answer is 32,000 years, just short of 32,000 years. And to give you an idea, that's when man wasn't even known as man. When homo sapiens you know, were in a very rare and unique form a long, long time ago. So that's one trillion, not 15 trillion. To give you some other sense of perspective, if you made a million dollars every day, you earned a million every single day of your life, and you start in the time of Jesus Christ's birth, and every single day you made a million dollars up to 2012, you wouldn't have even gotten close to earning a trillion dollars. It would take you almost another thousand years to get to that number. And we're talking about 15 trillion in deficit, and we're talking about, or debt I should say, and we're talking about a situation with 117 trillion of unfunded liabilities. I'll just give you one more metaphor, an accurate one. If you took the 15 trillion that we owe, and you made it into dollar bills, 
and you put them end to end, side to side, you could cover every single highway and every country road in America two times over with literally dollar bills. It's such a staggering number, it's beyond imagination. And yet people throw these numbers around because people don't make much of a difference in their mind between a million and a billion. In fact, over two centuries, from the time of George Washington's administration all the way to the end of the Reagan administration, the U.S. accumulated a total debt of $2.2 trillion. Now today you might just say just $2.2 trillion because here's what will blow your mind. In the last 24 months alone, between August 2009 and August 2011, we've created an additional debt of $2.95 trillion, almost $3 trillion that we've accumulated literally in two years, more than it took us to accumulate in 200 of the previous years of all the American administrations. So now you get a chance to appreciate some hard work that comes from just one dedicated blogger taking the time to spell out for you in plain English what the issues really are. When I was looking online, trying to find ways to be able to show you a visual way to see quickly what the deficit is, or I should say what this year's spending is gonna be and how we're gonna meet it, I came across this blog by this man named Iowa Hawk, who is more of a conservative, I'm more independent, so I'm not gonna use his inflammatory language, but what he did a damn good job of, and our research team went and did additional research on, is coming up with the real numbers. And this is his format. So I'm gonna pretty much take what he got in his, put it out in his blog and make it more visual for you in this video. So I wanna thank you for Iowa Hawk in advance for putting this brilliant information out. And you can find Iowa Hawk at iowahawk.typepad.com if you wanna read his material. But be aware that he's more conservative in his personal approach. So he's a bit inflammatory if you're more independent or if you're more liberal in your approach. So I also wanna thank my research team because Iowa Hawk did this in 2010 for the 2011 budget. And we've gone through and done all the research my team has to give you the 2012 numbers. So these are the current numbers. So let's begin. Let's look at some basic research and try and figure out how do we actually pay for this 379 trillion that President Obama and this Congress have planned to spend in 2012. By the way, that's $10.4 billion a day that we gotta live on. Just think about it. We got America has to live on 10 billion a day and we're borrowing more than 4 billion of that every single day just to stay afloat. So let's start with a calendar and let's start at 12.01 a.m. January 1st. Now, according to Iowa Hawk, the only thing more evil to a liberal than a rich person is a rich corporation. So he takes those two corporations that he thinks most people that are liberal consider to be the most evil, which is ExxonMobil and Walmart, and he says, forget the high taxes. Let's just take every single penny of their combined 2011 global profits. That's $46.7 billion. Now, if we spend all of their profits, it only gets us from midnight on January 1st to 12.45 p.m. on January 5th. That's after taking the profits, all of them, global profits, the two largest corporations in the world. So that's not too impressive. So he starts to say, let's look at this deeper. Let's take every single penny of profit, every penny that comes from the other 498 companies on the Fortune 500, all of it, that's $567 billion, and that still just gets us to 12.15 a.m. on February 29th, my birthday, leap year. This isn't getting us where we need to go. We've taken every dime of profit from the big Fortune 500 companies, and it's a few weeks after the Super Bowl, so what do we do? Maybe we go back and we just grab all the corporate advertising, all that was spent, which was $200 million. That'll run the country for about 28 minutes. But why stop there? Let's take all of the ad money, all, all the 46 years of Super Bowls. That totals $5.2 billion. If somehow we could have a retroactive tax and get all 46 years of all the money ever spent we'd still only be able to get to 12.15 p.m. on the same day, February 29th. Look, it's obvious that we're not just getting where we wanna go, so we can't just throw it off the backs of corporations. So Iowa says, let's, let's really go after what liberal politicians are asking. Let's soak those rich people. And we're gonna do it by going after, let's start with, let's say, the athletes. They get these obscene sports salaries, and they're not really adding any value, so let's just take all of their salaries from both the NFL, the NBA, the NHL, Major League Baseball, not their endorsement deals, but all of their salaries, and let's also take the winnings of the PGA Tour 
and the money spent on NASCAR, put it all together. And that's $10.1 billion. Now I want you to remember, it takes 10.4 billion just to fund the country every day. So we don't even get a day out of it. Basically, it gets us to 11.35 a.m. on the next day, March 1st. After all this, we basically funded the country for two months. So look, forget the athletes. Take all their money, but that's obviously not gonna be enough, so let's get to all the really rich people. Let's take 100% of every penny that anyone who makes above, say, $250,000 a year, certainly that'll take care of you know, all of our financial needs for the country for at least a year, won't it? Let's see. According to the Census Bureau, the U.S. Census Bureau, the number of households, U.S. households that are at that number, there's 117.5 million. The percentage of those households that make over $250,000 a year now in that income range is almost 2%, but let's round it up to 2%. And let's take that number and find out what it is. So that number of households really above $250,000 in income right now is 2%. 1,350,716 households. The total income, check this out, from all those households that make over $250,000 a year is a total of $1.363 trillion. Now we're talking, right? Uh, you know, Iowa Hawk says, let's just eat the rich, let's take everything they got, everything that anyone makes over $250,000 a year, and let's see where that really gets us. It gets us from March 1st at 1 p.m. to July 10th, on 1 p.m. on July 10th, I should say. Now, how, where do we go from here? We've taxed the richest people in the world, the richest corporations in the world. Look, obviously, we're gonna have to really cut some spending somewhere. Well, why don't we just stop spending money on you know, the wars in Iraq and in Afghanistan? I think there are a lot of us that would love to see that happen. Um, after all, that money is going away to things that could be used for healthcare, or is it just being used really on wars for oil? So let's not spend another dime starting tomorrow. Let's just somehow cut it all off instantaneously, and let's all bring them all home right now. Many people would support that. That, if we somehow could magically do it, would save us $117 billion this year in 2012. That's enough savings basically to cover us until 8 p.m. on July 21st. Listen, who else can we tax that's living too well? Because after all, we need more money. We've got to pay our bills here in the U.S. So Iowa Hawk says this, screw you, Star Wars. We're going to take every penny that you made in movies and toys and lunch boxes, the whole shebang. It took you 35 years for your $26.6 billion, and we're going to come up with some retroactive tax, and we're going to take it all. How much of a difference would that really make in paying our bills? Well, It'll knock us all the way down to 9.20 a.m. on July 24th. Well, look, everyone knows those Hollywood people. They're, they only employ rich actors and producers and directors, and they all live in Beverly Hills. So let's evict everyone in Beverly Hills. Let's confiscate their home, and let's sell all their homes at market value. Look, there's 15,000 homes in Beverly Hills. The average price, $3.2 million. That'll get us $48 billion dollars paying our bills through July 29th of this year, still in July. Obviously, this isn't working. So Iowa Hawk says, look, Michael Moore assures us that there's plenty of money out there, and it's all tied up with the rich. So guess what liberal billionaires Warren Buffett and Bill Gates, he says? Tough luck for you. His suggestion? You guys are worth $100 billion between the two of you. Maybe it's time for an accidental fall down the stairs. And through the inheritance tax, we will magically keep 50% of that loot and that'll give us 50 billion to help pay our bills. Uh, how far will that get us this year? Well, really, if we kill them both off and took half of everything they have, it gets us to 7 p.m. on August 2nd of this year. All right, look, let's get serious. There's 398 more billionaires in America, according to the latest Forbes 400, with a combined total net worth of 1.4 trillion. He says, if we can just arrange a few more hundred accidents at 50% death tax, kill them all off, take all their estate money, and we'll have another $700 billion. But even still, after killing all the US billionaires and all the jobs and opportunities they create, it helps us pay our bills only till 2 a.m. on October 9th of this year. We're still not even to pay our bills for the entire year. 
Okay, let's forget this mamby-pamby 50% nonsense, he says. Kill all the billionaires and forget 50%. Forget their heirs. Take all of their money, all of it. They're all crooks anyway. Take everything and take, well, let's say the 100 or so other almost billionaires. Take everything they've got as well. And that just gets us another 32 days until 12.30 a.m. on November 10th. Well, that's the start of the holiday season, isn't it? So let's pull a little Grinch and let's take all the sales from all the holiday shopping that's expected this year, a whopping $469 billion. That should hold us over till 12.55 p.m. on December 25th. Merry Christmas, everyone. <laughs> We're almost there. Now remember, this money is for America's poor, so in the spirit of Christmas, let's get rid of all that foreign aid, those dying children aids, all those things that we're trying to make a difference with. Let's get rid of all that. It's 53.3 billion. Let's keep it for ourselves. That gets us until 3.55 p.m. on December 30th. So I'm sorry, but we've still got a date and a little change to pay for. So to cover the remaining 13.8 billion, we're gonna to have to hit up every single man, woman, and child in America for $44 each to keep America intact and pay our bills for that final 32 hours of our year, which of course finally gets us to 12 o'clock January 1st, 2013. Happy New Year, everybody. But what happens next? You see, we've taken all the profits and all the salaries and all the assets and the expenses and the revenues and the holdings of the rich and those corporations, and we've liquidated them. So what happens when you kill off the golden goose? There's no more golden eggs. There's no more profits. There's no more revenues that are available for tax and thus fund our government. What are we gonna do? Yet President Obama and our Congress, meanwhile, they're proposing we spend another 3.8 trillion in 2013. And somehow, magically, we're gonna spend even more but he projects somehow that our deficit will be 